Okay, we are recording. 7.2 is operations on decimals. And, and y'all, 7.2, it's, it's a pretty easy section. Um, so uh, I guess the easiest way for me to kind of describe this, like, again, if this is, if you were dealing with a group of, you know, fifth graders or fourth graders or whatever, and y'all are talking about decimals, again, I don't, honestly, I don't know when decimals are introduced into elementary school students, but what they're talking about here is they're saying, look, let's, um, let's use base 10 blocks to how would we demonstrate um, adding and subtracting decimals. So they're going to use like these squares to represent the whole number part. So two would mean that there's two squares, okay? A tenth means I'm going to use one of these long strips right here. So that's one tenth. And then each of the individual little squares or little cubes, whatever you want to call them, are the hundreds. So two and one tenth and six hundredths would be the same thing as 2.16. And again, the reason why it's 2.16, we talked about this when we did 7.1, is this is in the tenths place and that's in the hundreds place, right? And so if you're adding these kinds of numbers together, again, kids are real visual learners. So again, if you were showing this to a student, you would say, look, if I have two, two kind of these square palettes here and I have another square palette here, now I have a total of three square palettes. And if I have seven, I'm sorry, one little strip here and seven more little strips here, now I have a total of eight little strips here. And if I have six individual cubes and three individual cubes, now I have a total of nine individual cubes. Again, kids are visual learners. They learn by, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, oh my God, I can't think of the word off the top of my head right now. But when you give them like models like this, so they have like actual little squares or actual little sticks or actual individual cubes, like they're uh, by touch, right? They can, they learn that way and they can count them, right? And they can feel them. So again, you know, if you're dealing with a young, you know, a young class, a lot of times kids learn this way. This is how we learn. I don't know about y'all, but you know, how the way I learned how to like count money was just playing with coins when I was a kid, you know, that's kind of how we learn. So um anyway this is sort of the idea here okay so again y'all when I, i'm going to zoom in on this problem here kind of figure out what i'm what i'm supposed to be doing and so the first problem here says use decimal grids to model 0 0.8 minus 0 0.4 okay so first thing i want to mention is 0 0.8 would mean that i'm looking at eight of those sticks right so one two three four five six seven eight that's what i'm looking at i'm looking for eight of those sticks and if I'm subtracting four, and it's in the hundreds position, I'm subtracting four of the little individual squares, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do, which probably be easiest for me is to say, okay, which ones have eight strips? And it looks like B, C, and D all seem to have eight strips. Now, which one is taking away four individual squares? Well, this one is only, is only taking away three. This one looks like it's taking away eight. Here we go. This one is taking away four of the little individual. I want to make sure I'm counting that right. One, two, three, four. No, that's taking more. Ah, here it was. Sorry. I missed it. This one here is taking away, oops, this one here is taking away four individual squares, right? One, two, three, four. So my choice here, y'all, would be B. That's really all we're doing here, okay? All righty. So the second problem says uh, some of the digits in the following number are covered by squares. If each of the digits one through nine is used exactly once in the number, determine the greatest possible number. Okay, so y'all, the way I would approach this problem is I would write out my digits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so I know that we've already used five, so I'm gonna scratch out five. We've already used three and we've already used eight. So when I'm gonna write this number out, what I'm really looking for is I wanna put the numbers that I'm left with in order from biggest to smallest, because I'm looking for the biggest number here. So right here, y'all, I would put a nine, okay? Because that's the biggest number I still got left. Then I would put a seven right there. Then I would put a six right here and a four right here. 
and a two over here, and then a one right there, right? So it's kind of hard to see in green. So what number would I have? 597, 3, 6, 4, 2, 8, and 1. And that would be the number that I would write out. And again, all I'm really doing here is just putting the numbers that I'm still left with in order from biggest to smallest, right? And I can't do anything with a 5, 3, and the 8 because those numbers were already chosen for me. All right, again, y'all, you know, the, the whole point of this class is how would I show you, how would you teach this to a group of kids? And, you know, so like this problem here, I don't know, it's, you know, how would you teach this to a group of kids? It's pretty straightforward, right? So you're saying, look, Danny went to the store, bought a chair for $19.92, bought a rake for $9.56, Bought a spade, that's really a shovel, right, for $10.42. A lawnmower for $142. Oops. $142.72. And two six packs of water for $235. So I'm going to put $235 twice. Okay. And so, y'all, what I'm doing here is if I was showing this to a group of kids, this might be what I might write out initially. And then I might say, well, you know what? Uh, I'm trying to think back when I was in elementary school. Usually my teacher would write the biggest number and then we'd start writing the two digit numbers like 1992 and 1042. And then we'd go with the one digit numbers or three digit numbers, whatever you want to call them, the 956 and the 235 and another 235. And then again, I, you know, how would you show this to a group of kids is, you know, they're probably not using a calculator just yet. So you would just kind of add them up together, right? But we know that we're in big school, so I'm going to go ahead and use my calculator here, right? But I would say 142.72 plus 19.92 plus 10.42 plus. 9.56 plus 2.35 plus another 2.35. And I'm coming up with $887.32. Okay. But again, this is probably how I would, you know, show this to a group of kids. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's take a look here. The next problem says a bank statement shows a check and account balance of $72.07. Uh, the bank recorded in the checkbook shows only, I'm sorry, the balance recorded in the checkbook shows only $27.25. After checking the canceled checks against the record of these checks, the customer finds that the bank has not yet recorded six checks in the amount of 526, 226, all of those numbers there. Okay. Is the bank record correct? Okay. So y'all, this is what I'm going to do. Um, right now, my balance is $27.25, right? Uh, let's see. What I want to do is I want to add these numbers up and see if I'm going to get back to my 7207, okay? So, look, I'm going to write down the numbers that I have, 5.46, 2.26, 2.26, Nine point seventy four, two point thirty eight, and ten point sixty two. Again, if I was showing this to kids, I'd probably put the the fifteen and the ten sixty two first, and then all the other ones. But I'm just going to go ahead and add those numbers up. Okay, so five point forty six plus two point twenty six plus fifteen and forty five cents, and nine dollars and seventy four cents, and two dollars and thirty eight cents and ten dollars and sixty two cents okay so i'm coming up with fifty six dollars and fifty three cents okay and i've already had twenty seven dollars and twenty five cents that's going to give me eight seven uh that's thirteen and that is eight so eight thirty or eighty three dollars and seventy eight cents okay and the bank is only recording $72.07, okay? So what I want to know is, am I correct? Is the bank statement correct? No, it isn't because this number here is different from, oops, this
this one here. So what I want to do is I want to figure out what's the difference in those numbers, okay? So look, if I take $83.78 and I subtract $72.07, that's one, that's seven, that's one, that's one. So it looks like the bank is under $11.71, right? Because we're supposed to have $83 and we only got 72 All right, so y'all, 7.2, again, pretty straightforward, okay? Shouldn't be anything out of the ordinary here. Um, I'm going to look at the next problem here, y'all, and it says, if each of the following sequences are arithmetic, okay, all that means is that there's going to be a common difference between those numbers there. There's a common difference between each of those numbers. So from 0.7, to 1.3, I added 0.6. From 1.3 to 0.9, I added 0.6. We're continuing to add 0.6 each time. All it wants me to do is write three more terms. So if I'm 3.1 and I add 0.6, that's going to give me 3.7. And again, y'all, if you want to use your calculator, by all means, use it. Add a 0.6, 4.3. Add a 0.6, 4.9. That's all I'm really doing here. Same thing for part B. From 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, we added 0.1. We added 0.1. So what's the next one to be? 0.9. What's the next one to be? 1. What's the one going to be after that? 1.1. I'm just adding 0.1 to each of them, right? So 0 0.9, 1, 1 1.1. 3.7, 4.3, 4.9. I'm just predicting the next three. All righty. Again, I'm just moving along here, y'all. It says, suppose that to predict how tall a four-year-old will be at the age 12, we're going to multiply their height by 1.5. And it says, if Allie is 108.6 centimeters when she's four, predict how old she's going to be when she turns 12. So we're going to take that number, 1.5, and we're going to multiply it by her current height, which is 1.6, because we got to multiply by 1.5. So again, I'm going to do the same thing here. Oops. Move this guy over. 1.5 times 108.6. And I'm coming up with 162.9 centimeters, right? All righty, let's keep moving along. Ah, okay. So y'all, we did something similar to this, I want to say back in chapter six. And it says, suppose the value of the yen in Japan in November of 13 was given by the equation $1 is equal to 99.925 yen. And it says, what's the value of $140? Okay, so look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a ratio and proportion. I know that one American dollar is the same thing as 99.925 yen. And part A is asking me, what's the value of $140? So if I have dollars on the top here, y'all, I'm going to put dollars on the top here. Oops. And down here at the bottom, I'm going to put X, and that's going to be in yen. And all I'm going to do now, y'all, I'm just going to cross multiply, right? So I would go like this. Well, 1 times x is just x, and then I'm going to use my calculator to multiply 99.925 times 140, and that's going to give me 130, or I'm sorry, 13,989.5, and that's how many yen we're going to have, right? And again, all I'm doing is I'm using this part to write a proportion okay so look i'm going to do part b i'm going to do it the same way first i'm going to do i'm going to write one dollar is the same thing as 99.925 yen okay now in part b it tells me we found a shirt that costs 2900 yen so i'm going to put that 2900 on the bottom why because yen goes on the bottom we're trying to figure out how many dollars I'm going to have on the top, okay? And just like we did before, y'all, we're going to cross multiply. 
So look, 1 times 2,900, that's still 2,900. 99.925 times x is a 99.925 with an x. And then I'm going to go ahead and divide by the 99.925 so I can get my x by itself. Okay. And I'll take my calculator, 2,900, divided by 99.925. Oops, I did times, sorry. Uh, 2,900 divided by 99.925. Okay, here we go. 29.02, and I'm coming up with a whole bunch of stuff here. Okay, so y'all, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write 29.02, there's some other change after that, 176, all that kind of fun stuff. Okay, so I want you to notice on the directions here, it says we're going to round to the nearest cent. Round to the nearest cent just means I want to round to that decimal place because I'm going to got to have two, two digits, right, for, for money. So remember, all I'm asking is, is this number closer to $29.02 or $29.03? And we know it's closer to $29.02, right? All right. So let me do this part over here. Come again. Uh, again, same kind of problem, y'all. It says a U.S. $1 bill was valued at 0 .9077 Swiss francs. Okay, first thing I'm going to do, $1 is the same thing as 0 .9007. I'm going to go SF for Swiss francs. On a particular day, what was the value of $23.45 American dollars in Swiss francs that day? So again, I know the amount in American dollars, 23.45. I'm looking for the amount in Swiss francs. Again, all I would do here is just cross multiply. So one times X is a one X and then 0.977 times 23.45. And I'm coming up with, again, I'm going to round to the nearest penny. So I'm coming up with 21.2855. Okay, since I'm trying to round to the nearest penny, this is the number that I want to round. So I'm asking myself, is my number here $21.28? Five, five, is that closer to $21 and 28 cents or 29 cents? And we would say closer to 29 cents, right? Because since that number is a five, that number has to bump up. All right. So let me keep scrolling here because, yeah, I think there's a couple more problems. Yeah, just a few more. Uh, so again, you know, thinking about how would I approach this problem here with the group of elementary school kids it says, I went to the store to buy canned tuna. These are the sizes and the prices of each brand, which is the best buy based solely on the cost per ounce. Okay. So when I look at brand A, it says we can get nine, five ounce cans or nine, five ounce cans, ah, ounce cans, sorry. So if we have nine cans that are five ounces each, wouldn't that really be a total of 45 ounces? And that's 45 ounces for $9.45. So what I want to do is I want to figure out what is the price, the cost per ounce, okay? So what I'm going to do here, y'all, is I'm going to take my 945 and I'm going to divide it by the number of ounces, okay? So let me take 9.45 and divide it by 45 ounces. And so we're getting 0 0.21 cents per ounce, okay? I'm going to do the same thing for part B, okay? So we have eight five-ounce cans. If we multiply that, that really means that we have 40 ounces. And 40 ounces cost $6.80. So I want to figure out what's the price per ounce. So I'm going to take 680, 
I'm going to divide that by 40. And so for brand B, I'm getting 17 cents an ounce. Okay. okay, let's take a look at part C. So 12 five ounce cans. So what's 12 times five? I want to say it's 60. Yep, so we got 60 ounces at $37.20. That seems a little high. 37 and 20 divided by 60 ounces. So notice 62 cents an ounce, right? And then part D is in dog is four five ounce cans. So that's going to give me 20 ounces at two dollars and eighty cents okay so let's take that 280 divided by 20 and 14 cents an ounce okay so now we're looking for the best buy solely based on the cost per ounce so uh a is 21 cents an ounce B is 17 cents an ounce, C is 16 cents an ounce, D is 14. So we're going to go with D because the cost per ounce is 0 0.14, which is the lowest or cheapest or whatever you want to say, right? It's going to be a little drop down menu, but you'll just say which one it happens to be, right? In this case, it's the lowest. All right. Um, Y'all, scientific notation, I'm kind of surprised that we do it here. But again, I started thinking about this the other day, and it's like, well, again, this class really is supposed to prep you whether you're teaching anywhere between kinder and eighth grade. And so junior high kids would probably be exposed to scientific notation. Scientific notation, y'all, is just a way to write numbers that are really, really, really big or numbers that are really, really, really small. So um, if when you graduate, if you're offered a job and it's going to be your first year teaching and they're going to offer you $78,000, I'd say take that job, right? That's a pretty good salary. Uh, teachers who work 20 years aren't making 78000 So anyway, it's a pretty big number. The idea here, y'all, is we're going to write this in scientific notation. Scientific notation just says we're going to find where our decimal point is. And if you don't see it, it's always understood to be at the end. What we're going to do, y'all, is we're going to move that decimal point to the left. We want to move it just so that we get a number that's bigger than 1 but smaller than 10. So what I mean by that, y'all, I'm going to put it between the 7 and the 8 because that number is bigger than 1 but it's smaller than 10. So I wouldn't want to put it after the 8 because that would give me a 78 that's more than 10. I wouldn't want to put it in front of the 7 because that would be like 78 cents. It has to be a dollar more. So it's always going to go between the first two digits that are not zero. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this by a power of 10. The way we figure out what power of 10 it's going to be is we're just going to count how many spaces did we move our decimal point. So we went one, two, three, four. So my answer in scientific notation y'all is 7.8 times 10 to the fourth. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing with the second problem. I'm going to think of my decimal point being over here, and I'm going to move it to the first two digits that are not zero. So I'm going to put it right there. So I'm going to have a 9.3 times 10. Now let's see how many spaces did we move it. That's three, that's six, that's nine. So we moved it nine spaces. Now, y'all, one thing I want to mention about these two here, oops, sorry trying to get my eraser. If you look at these two numbers that we had here, these two numbers are big numbers, right? Like this number here, y'all, is 9 billion, 300 million, right? That's a lot, big numbers. When my numbers are big, my powers are going to be positive, okay? Now, if you look at these two numbers, these numbers are really, really, really small. Remember what we said we're going to do? We're going to move our decimal so that it's between the first two digits that are not zero. So the first two digits that are not zero is right there between the one and the six. So I'm going to write 1.67 times 10. 
Now, again, I'm going to count how many spaces did I move in decimal? One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, because my number is a small number, my six, y'all, is going to be negative. Okay. Why? Because this number here is small. Okay. If I have small numbers, my power is going to be negative. If I have big numbers, my power is going to be positive. So again, I'm going to do exactly the same thing here. I'm just going to count. Look, one, two, three. So 6.35, we said we moved it three spaces. Again, because this number was small, my exponent again is negative. Okay. That's all scientific notation does, right? And when would kids see this? Probably in a science class, if you're trying to figure out how far is it from Earth to Pluto, uh, you know, billions of miles, right? Really far away. Uh, if a kid is in an eighth grade science class and they're talking about a cell or an atom, you know, what's the, how big is an atom? It's really, really, really small. So you use scientific notation to write those numbers out. Okay. Okay, so here, guys, all I'm doing, I'm just going backwards, okay? So I'm going to write this as a regular number. So right now, I have it in scientific notation. I want to write it as a regular number. First thing I notice, that exponent is positive. So that's just telling me that my number here is going to be big. So what am I going to do? I'm going to move my decimal four spaces to the right. So look, this is what I'm going to do. It used to be here. One, two, three. If I'm going to move it over here, then I got to put a zero. So that number is 20,320. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing for, look, let's do the other big one. Let's do this one here. This one is also big because my exponent is positive. So I'm going to write 102. Now, remember where my decimal used to be. It used to be between the one and the zero. So I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five. I got to put those zeros right there. So what number am I looking at? 102,000. Okay. Now, when I look at these next two here in the middle, y'all, first thing I notice is that those numbers are going to be small because my exponents are negative. Okay. So look, I'm going to go like this, 9056, right? I'm going to move it four spaces. It used to be here. One, oops, let me do it this way. Oops, not what I wanted to do. Okay, one, two, three, four. Point zero 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 nine zero five six. okay? Again, all I would do is I would get rid of this right here because I don't really need that, but I got to make sure that my decimal point is right there. Again, I would do the same thing for the other one. 4.8, remember, I'm going to move it six spaces. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So I got to put those zeros right there. Okay. Again, I would take all that stuff out. I don't want that decimal anymore, but I want my decimal point right there. Okay. So again, continuing here with scientific notation, y'all, all we're going to do is figure out, are these numbers big or small? Okay. So the first one says, write the numeral in the sentence in scientific notation. Okay, obviously I know that number is really big. So I'm going to put my decimal between the first two digits that are not zero. Remember where my decimal used to be? It used to be right here. That's three, that's six, that's nine, that's 10, that's 11. So 10 to the 11th, right? Okay. This one here, again, y'all, since my exponent is positive, that's telling me, hey, you know what? My number is big. So what am I going to do? I'm going to write 8, 8. Remember where my decimal used to be here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3, 4, and 5. And there's my number, 8,800,000. And we got our number done. Okay, so 
Uh, I'm just taking a look to see what we got here. I think these are the last couple of problems. Yeah, there's just a couple more here. Um, Y'all, you know, these next problems here are saying multiply each number by 0 0.01 using mental computation. So uh, I'm not going to really do mental computation. I'm going to do this out. Oops. I'm going to do this out, but I'm going to use my calculator. But I want you to kind of see a pattern here. So if I look at 2354 times 0 0.01, right? Look what we have now. We have 23.54. So I'm going to write that down over here. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing for the next one. So 32.09 times 0 0.01. And now I have 0 0.3209. So what I notice, y'all, is my decimal used to be here. And now it's there. And my decimal used to be here. And now it's there. So really all I've done is I've moved my decimal two spaces to the left. So if I was doing part C, I would say this is what I'm going to have now, 0 0.0039, because I moved my decimal two spaces to the left, right? And if I did part D, I would do the same thing. I would move it two spaces. Excuse me, I would move it two spaces to the left. Now, do you have to do it using mental? No, you could use your calculator again, right? But the idea is what they're trying to show you is that when you multiply by a 0 0.01, you move your decimal two spaces to the left. So look, 0 0.0039, that's exactly what we had right there, right? That's kind of the idea here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so y'all, for this next one here, it says we're going to round 629.876 to the nearest hundredth, to the nearest tenth, to the nearest unit, and to the nearest ten, and the nearest hundred. Okay, so let's do it this way. In order for us to round to the nearest hundred, that seven is in the hundredth position. So what I'm going to ask myself is, should I leave that seven alone, or should I bump it up? And because the number to the right of it is a 6, I'm going to bump that up to an 88. Okay. Now, to the nearest tenth, the tenths position, y'all, is the 8. So I'm going to say, should I leave that as an 8 or should I bump it up to a 9? Because that is a 7, I'm going to bump it up. Okay. All right. To the nearest unit just means we're going to round it to the nearest 1. So what that's telling me is, should I leave it as 629 or should I bring it up to 630? So I'm going to say, look, I'm going to bring that up to 630. Okay. To the nearest 10, that's the 2. So is 629.876 closer to 629 or 630? It's closer to 630. Okay. And then to the nearest 100, we're saying, is that number closer to 600 or closer to 700? And we'd say that number is closer to 600. So that's really all we're doing in that problem. Okay, We're just rounding to different place values. All righty. So the last couple of problems here, y'all, says John wants to buy some camera equipment. To estimate the total cost, he's going to round each price to the nearest dollar. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here, um, $37.58, that's actually closer to $38. $18.31, that's closer to $18. And $7.83, that's closer to $8. So I'm going to add these numbers up. 8, 8, and 8 is 24. Uh, and that should be 64. So my rounded price here, y'all, would be 64. Okay, and again, all we're doing is we're just rounding to the nearest whole number right, or the nearest dollar in this case. All right, and that right there, y'all, is 7.2. It should be pretty straightforward, pretty easy breezy cover girl, short and sweet, not too long. Uh, let me go ahead and stop this recording here.